All right, well, you know that we've been on this series called Fool, and um, today I'm going to finish it, but I'm going to finish it pretty strong, but don't worry, it's not condemning or shameful, it's pretty awesome, actually. There's been a lot of salvations today, like crazy, like a lot of people have given their life to Christ, and that's a beautiful thing, because that says that people, they, they want to be full of God's love, they want to be full of God's peace, and... Um, if you missed the last two weekends, we talked about how to be full of God's wisdom, how to make God choices, how to make God decisions. Um, and we, we've been using this verse or this text in John 10, 10, where it says, the thief does not come except to what? Steal, kill, destroy. Okay, this is Jesus saying this in John 10, 10. These were the words of Jesus. But he would never give Satan that glory and just leave that statement the way it is. At the latter part of that verse, it says, but I have come to give them life and give them what? Life more what? Abundantly. I've come to give them a full, abundant life. And so the question that we've been presenting for the last two weekends is, well, how do you experience the, the full promise, the full life of Jesus? Like, how does that even work? And today I want to talk to you about how that works. And this is going to speak to every single one of us here. Here's... The first point, there are two postures we have to live by as followers of Jesus Christ. The first posture, everybody say posture. Okay, posture is what you're doing right now. Like some of you, you you posture yourself real good, nice and straight like me. I'm always focused on on my posture because of my back. I want a good, strong back as I turn 110 years old, right? And so I want to have a strong... But some of us, we posture with a little, you know, a little slant, a little cake back. Well, I don't know how you posture yourself. But during worship, we postured ourselves, right? When you sat down, you postured yourself. When you get in a vehicle, you posture yourself. When you got a bad attitude, you posture yourself, right? So if you're going to be a person that's going to live the fullness in Jesus, you have to posture yourself with two things, okay, as a follower. Number one, Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit? It's the spirit and the presence of God. You and I have to posture ourselves in such a way where we believe that the spirit of the living God, if you have given your life to Christ, that means that God's spirit now dwells in you. But just because his spirit dwells in you doesn't mean that you're active or postured in the things of the Holy Spirit. And we know who the Holy Spirit is. Jesus said, I no longer want you to be an orphan. I, don't, I no longer want you to feel abandoned. So if you feel like you're an, you're an, you have an orphan's heart or you feel like you've been abandoned or lonely, that's not true. The Holy Spirit was given by Jesus so that we would no longer be called orphans. He has filled us with his presence. That means you and I, like, wasn't worship just, like, amazing today? Like, man, you can feel the presence of God in this place, right? But you know how that happened? When people posture themselves. That doesn't happen because we got good musicians, good singers, amazing singers. That doesn't happen. That happens when there's a church. When, when we posture ourselves in a place of worship, you pull on God's presence, amen? The second thing is faith. Say faith. Faith is this simple, belief not based upon proof. That's the simple definition of faith. It's belief not based on proof. And how many know that God doesn't have to prove himself? He doesn't have to prove himself. But by the grace and the mercy of God, he has proven himself. Let's just take the Bible. There's over 5,000 prophetic promises in the scripture. Do you realize that 2,000, a little bit over 2,500 of those prophecies have already come to pass that's proof that god is real let's just look at your life how many of you right now would say i should be dead right now literally whether you were uh someone that was in a horrible accident or someone that you know had a drug addiction someone who was an alcoholic maybe you were someone that was experiencing cancer okay i've been that person i should not be standing on this stage right now but by the grace and the mercy of god that proves that there's a God who is filled with so much love. Amen? Like, you got to thank God for that. Give him a big hand clap. So the increase of these two postures in our life is dependent on what we do with them. When you, everybody say, me, God's not going to do it for you. I don't care how many times you sit in this church or any church for that matter. It doesn't matter how many sermons you listen to. You can listen to every great podcast sermon in the world. And let me tell you something. 
Nothing will change until you posture, until you and I posture ourselves in a position knowing that the Spirit of God himself, there is no greater sermon than the Bible. There is no greater revelation than the Holy Spirit. There is no greater faith than the seed that Jesus already planted in us called the mustard seed faith that can move mountains. Amen? You can't move mountains. God moves mountains. But we need faith. And so that means that if I'm going to have an increase, if I'm going to see an increase of the Holy Spirit in my life, if I'm going to see increase of faith in my life, then i got to do something. I have to do something. Just like favor. How many want the favor of God? Well, guess what? You can't buy favor. You cannot buy the favor of God. There's no such thing as buying the favor of God. Let me tell you something. If you want more of God's favor, that only happens through obedience and sacrifice. When you have obedience and sacrifice in your life, the favor of the living God will be upon you, man. There is nothing that God will withhold with you. But when we are disobedient, when we lack sacrifice, when we lack humility, there is no favor. There's none. We need to increase in this area. You increase the Holy Spirit. You increase faith. Guess what happens? All of a sudden, you start seeing the, the favor of God. It, it, it's almost like it's attractive. The Holy Spirit, it makes you attractive. It does. When you have the Spirit of God living in you, people are like, man, there's something, there's something unique about you. It's the most amazing thing. So uh, God says, when you do something, there is a spiritual release that takes place in your life. When you do something. You guys here today? Look at your name and be like, are you doing something? Okay, look at X. Let me break this down. So, because we're going we're, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna back up everything I say today, okay? This, is, this isn't my opinion. I'm giving you the word today. Acts 11, 24. Look what it says. It says Barnabas. Everybody say Barnabas. Barnabas. I encourage you, anywhere you see names or a scripture that fits your, your season, put your name in it. That's, that's faith right there. So at the count of three, instead of Barnabas, we're going to say your name. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay, so Mauricio and Elevate Church was a good man. There's a lot of good men in here, a lot of good women in here. But how many know that good is not enough? Good doesn't cut it. Good is good. I'm glad you're good. But there's a definition, there's a description there's a posture that Timothy or, or, or Paul is writing here in Acts chapter 11 where he says, and Barnabas or an elevate church were good men. Why? Because he was full of what? The Holy Spirit. He was what? Full of the Holy Spirit and he was full of what? Faith. And large numbers of people came to know the Lord. It's not, it's not enough just to say, I'm a good person. Yes, you're a good person that's filled with the Holy Spirit, and you're full of faith. That's the kind of people that God is looking for that know how to posture themselves in that position, and amazing things happen. So when you allow the Holy Spirit, or when you give the Holy Spirit permission to, to do life with you, there is a complete metamorphosis, there's a complete transformation in your life and my life. Now, I know that in every church, not everyone has had a complete transformation because we all have different walks. Some of us just got saved. And some of us are very new in the faith. Some of us, you know what, maybe you've been saved for a long time, but there hasn't been a complete transformation and you're angry, you're mad. But let me tell you something. We can't blame God for a lack of transformation. The Holy Spirit is the only one who can give you a complete change of your life. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. But we also need faith because we need to put faith in the Holy Spirit, in the work of the Spirit of God, in the work of what Jesus did. And then in return, we start seeing transformation. Now, let me give you an example of someone who had a complete change and transformation. Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. It says, then Saul, we know that Saul was the Apostle Paul, but this is before his transformation. Isn't that good news that we all have an opportunity to be better after today? That's the grace of God that we can change today. Whatever it is, whether it's an attitude, an idea, a mindset, whatever it is. Look, it says, then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any who were of 
the way. What was the way? Capital W, the way of Jesus. Anyone who was filled with the Holy Spirit and anyone who was full of faith, this was a modern-day terrorist. Saul was a Christian killer, okay? And it goes on to say, who, uh, he says, so that if, if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so we know the story. I'm not preaching his message today, uh, but here's what happens. Paul is now, he's got the letters in his hand. And he's on his horse on the road to Damascus. And you know what Jesus does? He gives him an uppercut. Boom. And listen, Saul goes flying in the air, falls to the ground. And what's interesting is that Saul at least had a little bit of conscience to know that he was God. Because he said, Lord, aren't you glad that, that every single one of us, regardless if you're someone who's church or unchurch, you know that there's a little bit of conscience that there, there must be a God? You know there's something, some interest. And so Saul is there, and he's before Jesus. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know what's another relief? Is that when people come against you, don't trip. Jesus is saying, hey, listen, when they come against you, they come against me. He didn't say, uh, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my Christians? Why are you persecuting my disciples why are you persecuting my church no he said why are you persecuting me so leave vengeance to god leave it to him let god deal with it that right there just like <sighs> if not you'll be bound like saul was doing with the disciples don't we get bound when we try to take it upon ourselves you get you get weird you get funky and you get you can become all bent out of shape, unforgiving. Let it go. It's not worth it. Why are you persecuting me is what, is what he tells Paul. And so we know that here you have Saul who now has this complete connection or, or encounter with Jesus. And, and Jesus literally just, he makes him blind. He's blind now. And some other believer has to come get him and takes him to the house. And long story short, they minister to him. They pray with him. They get him filled with the Holy Ghost. He's under transformation. He's under renewal. And then God calls him to do something crazy and amazing. Because here's the deal. By birth, Saul was a Jew. By conviction, he was a Pharisee. By citizenship, he was a Roman. By education, he was a Greek. But by grace, he became a Christian. By the grace of God. And once that change came, here's what happened. Look at, look at what happened. Look what his transformation came with. Look up on the screen. Look. Paul was transformed and became a missionary, a theologian, evangelist, pastor, teacher, preacher, an organizer, a leader. Here's my favorite. A thinker. Be awesome to get Christians that think. Amen? <laughs> That's why I did that on caps. <laughs> that was on purpose. Um, a thinker, a statesman. A fighter, but he was also a lover. He was all these things all at one time. That's why, that's where the name apostle comes. He had all the gifts of the house of God. Every single one, he was operational. And it was pretty amazing because this was a full conversion of the Holy Spirit. And prior to all this, Paul was following man's tradition and man's culture. Why am I sharing this with you? Because if we're not careful, right now, you can be following a fashion, a culture, or a tradition of something you learn, but it doesn't reflect what God said in his word. What do I mean by that? Okay, well, yeah, we can talk about how Saul was religious. He was always around the Pharisees and the synagogues, and he thought he was doing some righteous thing for God. It's so easy to think right now where you're sitting that you're right, and God's wrong. It's that easy. And I say this because I don't want to just talk about, you know, Paul's issues or Saul's issue. We're talking about our culture today. I'm talking about the modern day church. Have you noticed that the modern day church has literally reduced the Holy Spirit and faith to feelings and intellect? Think about it. The modern day church, it's always about what's going to move them. Because we're, listen, God, God gifted us with feelings. But he said, walk by faith, not by or feelings. And so, or there, there's this intellect. We've reduced it to like, okay, how do I get in the heads of those that are arguing faith in their head? Like, let me tell you something. When, when you think about faith, okay, faith is you coming to the place 
where you have to abandon your ideas. You have to abandon your theology, whatever you've created. You have to abandon that pride and come to the place where we're like Saul's being converted to Paul's. And we just come to our knees and say, Lord, show me. It's God's looking for that humble heart, that pure heart that says, God, you know what? I'm struggling with this because if you just get stuck in the intellect, if we keep preaching sermons in churches, and I'm not talking to any church, I'm just saying the body of Christ in general. We water down the Holy Spirit. Like when was the last time you actually were aware that the Spirit of God is inside of you and said, good morning, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, how should I handle this? How should I react to that person? How should I respond? Holy Spirit, should I... Should I take this job? Holy Spirit, should I sell this house? Spirit of God, lead me. Why? The Holy Spirit is known as the counselor. He's the helper, but he ain't the doer. He's not going to do it for you. You and I, we have to do what? Posture ourselves. Position ourselves. And so what does that look like when I say, you know, we're about feelings and intellect? Well, let me throw a few just to kind of talk about this. We say things like, I don't feel I need to lift my hands because God knows my heart. Now, I'm not trying to dog anybody. Maybe you don't lift your hands in worship. I ain't hating on you. We love you. Keep coming. But I think sometimes if we don't check ourselves, man, we wreck ourselves. We start thinking the argument of, I don't have to lift my hands. God already knows my heart. I don't need to express myself. That's reducing faith. And the Holy Spirit, because all throughout scripture, you see, it says, lift holy hands. It says, clap your hands, all ye people. Amen. It says, give, 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 give God a big shout of praise, right? So it's, and I get it, because sometimes people think like, oh, that's a charismatic church. No, that's what man's tradition called people who clap, who sing, who shout, and who praise. We're a Bible church, and we take the whole counsel of God. Amen. The whole counsel. The whole thing. So, so I'm, just trying to, I'm just trying to teach us something here today. Or we have people that may think this way. I don't feel I need to pray because God already knows what I need. <laughs> I've had people share that with me, and, and they're, they're good people. They're like, Pastor, like, so why, do I, why should I pray for that if he already knows what I need? He knows what I'm angry about, so he might as well just, well, that's where faith steps in. It's like, think about it. It's like your child, if you're a parent. Well, let's just take my kids. Let's say my kids were way younger, and let's say they just came into the kitchen, and they looked at me, and they just started going. I'd be like, what? I'd be like, are you crazy? What do you want? And let's just say they were hungry. But if they would just said, hey, dad, we're hungry, I'd feed them, right? We think sometimes as kids think parents are mind readers or even spouses are mind readers. But the reality is God wants us to be like children. And he says, come boldly to the throne of what? Grace and ask the father. He says, you have not because you ask not. And so we keep thinking, well, God already knows what I need. God already. And we start being this childish group of people thinking, well, there's no, why, why even pray? Nothing happens. Nothing changes. And that's an attitude where we start reducing the Holy Spirit and we start reducing our faith to feelings. Unless I feel it, I'll believe it. No, no, no. God says, no, I want you to believe me and then you're going to feel me. Amen. How about this one? Um, uh, I don't feel I have to kneel before God because he already knows I'm humble. Huh? Sometimes, have you ever been in that place? Let's be honest. I've been there. Okay, I'm telling on me, Mauricio. I've been in services where, like, my spirit man is saying, Mauricio, kneel before the Father. And in my, in my flesh, I'm like, oh, I'm kneeling before my heart. You know, like, <laughs> like, my heart is kneeling. I don't physically have to do this. My heart is kneeling before Jesus right now. No, no, no. You know, I, I, I can't. I can't sit there and start arguing 
with this flesh because this flesh is not leading me closer to God. But the Holy Spirit inside of me is trying to lead me closer to him. And there's always a battle inside of us that is keeping us from lifting our hands, from taking a knee, right? From giving a shout of praise, from shouting the name of Jesus, amen? The enemy would love, he comes to steal, kill, destroy. Or how about this one? Oh, I don't feel like singing, clapping, or raising my hands because God already knows how much I love him. But here's the truth. Here's the truth. Look at this. 1 Timothy 4.1 says this. It says, the Holy Spirit clearly says that in the last days, some people will what? I'm sorry. What will people do in the last days? How many know people that are already leaving the faith? Yeah, I know people that are leaving the faith already. They don't have to tell me. You just see it. It's clear. They're leaving the faith. In the last days, this is, this is scary. Who's saying this? Who's saying this? Who's the one that's making this statement? Look at the, right there. No, no. The Holy Spirit clearly says. <laughs> it was an open book test. <laughs> the answer was there. I should have highlighted and underlined it. Now you see why I said thinker. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. The whole, how do I recover from that one now? <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. The Holy Spirit says that in the last days, some will leave the faith, but they'll leave to what? What are they, what are they leaving to? Finish the verse. What are they leaving to? To follow who? Spirits. It didn't say, that's why it's called capital T, the Holy Spirit. When we start defending our attitudes, our ideas, we will start creating a theology called doctrine of demons, and those doctrines of demons become spirits that we start following. That's where the spirit of confusion comes in. The spirit of division comes in, right? All these spirits start coming in. The spirit of chaos comes in. The spirit of depression, anxiety. There's things, how many know that, that beyond anxiety and depression, there's gotta be something deeper. There has to be. If we don't, if we can't see that there's something deep, it's gotta ha it has to have a source. Now I get it. We go through trauma and trauma's real. We go through, you know, very painful situations in our life. That is true. Nobody denies that. But how many know that the source has to be darkness? The enemy comes to what? Steal, kill, destroy. So we know who the source is. We know who the source is. And he said, this is what happens. But here's, here's the point I want you to write down. But our physical obedience releases spiritual breakthrough. Our physical obedience. Everybody say physical. It releases a breakthrough. It, it releases something spiritual. Think about it. When you and I are lifting hands, we're not, we're not, I'm not doing this for the person next to me. I mean, if you, if you think you're doing it just to look religious, then, then it's a waste of time. No, I'm lifting my hands into a spiritual realm, an unseen realm, where when I do this, when I posture myself before the presence of Almighty God, and I'm not warring in this intellect, in my head, thinking about what I'm going to eat, where I'm going to go, or how angry I am, or how upset I am, or how frustrated, it's a lot harder to worship God and be distracted when we don't get to that place where we focus and say, okay, you know, Lord, this is, this is my time to worship you. It's, it's me and you. So physical obedience releases spiritual breakthrough. So let me give you an example. Moses. So Moses is with the children of Israel. Is it warm in here? Am I just hot? It is warm, right? No? Yes, cold, hot. Let me see. How many cold people do I have in here? Lift your hands. How many hot people do I have in here? We lose. Sorry, hotters. We lose. The cold people win. The people have spoken. No, but check this out. So you have the, you have the, the Moses... He's with the children of Israel, and they're all, they're constantly, listen, they're constantly being attacked. Like, they're having challenge progressing. They're, they're, it's, it's like they, they move five steps forward only to take 30 steps back. The enemy constantly came after them. It was, it was overwhelming for Moses as a leader to lead the children of Israel to the promised land. Well, for one, the, the Israelites were always complaining and number two, the enemy was always trying to kill, steal, destroy. 
And so Moses is overwhelmed with all these feelings and this, these emotions as a leader. And, and he's just like praying to God and saying, look, God, they're destroying us. They're killing us, man. They're, they're, they're completely abolishing us. And in the process of Moses and the Israelites, Moses decides to position himself in prayer. And he begins to have a conversation with God. And here's the really cool part. God tells Moses something very simple. He says, go to the mountain and lift your hands. Like, that was an instruction. Like, I don't know about you, but if, if somewhere, if I were to say, hey, uh, I'm hungry. Like, I have no money. I'm hungry. Can you, can you help me? And they said, hey, uh, come back three days from now and I'll help you. I'm going to starve to death. They're like, you know, can I get something a little? And like, that's how Moses probably felt like, okay, uh, God, I don't think you understand. Uh, we're dying, and you want me to go climb a mountain while everyone else is being whacked, killed, destroyed? And so just understand this, like many of us, sometimes we get an instruction from God, but the reason we don't follow the instruction is because we want the fullness of the instruction. When God will never give you the fullness of the instruction, he will start you with an instruction, but you will complete the instruction. Amen? Let's not confuse instruction with commandment. See, a commandment was, is, is something like what? Honor your father and your mother? What's another commandment? Yeah, that shall not kill, right? That shall not steal. I love it. When you start hearing church, people are just making things up, right? That shall not eat ice cream after midnight, you know. It, it's okay. It happens. That's all right. But, but those are love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Okay, those are commandments. What God is giving Moses and what God is giving us are instructions. Instructions, like many of us know, they are meant to be followed or not. It's your choice. You can follow the instruction that God has already given you, or you can keep arguing within yourself and not posture yourself, position yourself for the blessing of God. So we know the story goes that Moses goes up to the mountain. He didn't have the full, you know, how's this all going to work out? But look at Exodus 17, verse 11, quickly. It says, as long as Moses held up the staff in his what? The Israelites had the advantage. Who had the advantage? The Israelites. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Do you understand what this is saying? In other words, it is to your advantage, it is to my advantage to never drop your hands. It is, our, it is to our advantage to always lift up our hand of praise, whether you feel it or not. You know, it's to our advantage to always give God a shout of praise. Even when we're singing songs like, you know, you're never going to, right, right? Or you are good, right? Help me out, church. Y'all leave me hanging here. Ready? One, two, three. You are good. We suck. Okay, let's not do that again. Let's <laughs> That was, yeah, doesn't do that. <laughs> okay, he ain't that good now. I mean, that was, that was bad. <laughs> that was bad. No. <laughs> that was really bad. Yeah. I haven't forgot my point already. <laughs> That's so horrible. No, the point is this, is that, <laughs> is that you can be singing, you are good. Listen, God is saying to us, I don't want you to say I'm good because everything's good. I want you to say I'm good when nothing's working for you. See, that's an instruction. An instruction is you give the Lord a shout of praise whether things are working for you or working against you. That's how you confuse. That's lifting up. So every time he lifted his hand, the enemy was being destroyed. The moment he put his hands down, the enemy was taking advantage. When you and I drop our praise, when you and I drop our faith, when you and I drop the reading of the word, when you and I drop our prayer life, let me tell you something. The enemy has one on us. But when we decide to lift our hands, when we decide to lift our voice, when we decide to serve mighty God, amen, when we, de when we decide to trust God, let me tell you something. Nothing can stop what God's going to do. Now, let me give you another thing because when you think about Moses' physical obedience, it released a spiritual blessing. There's something about that. There has to be. Why would it be all throughout the scriptures about lifting hands, lifting voice, clapping your hand? Why would he put it? There must be some truth to this. 
We have victory in this. And so every time that he lifted his hands, you know what would happen? The angels of the Lord, it wasn't that the Israelites turned into like these incredible hope people and, and started like beating their enemy. No. Every time that Moses lifted his hand, and you read the story on your own for sake of time, it says that the angels would come. It would, it's literally the spirit of death would come and completely take out the enemy. When you and I lift our hands, you're releasing you're releasing the angels of God. When you lift your hands, you're tapping into an unseen world. And whatever is in the unseen will manifest. That's why the Bible says in John 1, and the word Jesus became what? Flesh. Your lifting will become something in the tangible and the natural. But when you drop it, you're not, you're going to feel defeated all the time. You're going to feel anxious all the time. You're going to feel fear all the time. You're going to feel worried. No, you can't let that drive you anymore. You have to decide, I'm going to, I need the angels of Almighty God in this situation. Amen? I'll prove it to you scripturally. Now, New Testament, Hebrews 1.14 says this, All angels are spirits who serve. God sends them to serve those who will receive salvation. Come on, the angel of the Lord encamps ground about you. Amen? But the angels can't move. Until you move. You lift your hands. like right now, Everybody just lift your hands right now. High. Lift them high. And just say, thank you, Lord, that your angels are moving before me. You're helping me. You're healing me. You're redeeming me. Thank you for your favor, God. I will lift my hands to you. The favor of God is on me. I will overcome. In Jesus' name. Amen. And then angels go before you and they go to battle. They go to battle. <clears throat> There's a spiritual releasing of a breakthrough that happens. There's something supernatural that takes place. What you do with your physical obedience will be a spiritual reward, I'm telling you. It will be a spiritual reward. So we know that two guys show up on the picture. Let me see Moses here, please, the picture of Moses. Moses. But here's another truth. But you're going to have moments in your life you're going to get tired. You're not going to want to lift your hands. You're exhausted. You're disappointed. You've lost hope. There's going to be moments where you feel like, I don't want this faith. There's going to be moments where like, well, where was God in this? There's going to be moments where you're like, you know what? I, I don't remember the last time I've experienced the presence of God. I don't even feel God. That's where people come in. The two guys on the left and right of him is a guy named Ur and a guy named Aaron. And they had a personal revelation. They had already got the revelation that every time that Mosey lifts up his hands, there is a spiritual blessing. There is a spiritual victory that takes place. But then they started watching and they're like, man, but every time he puts his hands down, man, the enemy is putting a whip on us. So they said to themselves, let us get alongside of him. And Ur... And Aaron lifted up his arms, their leader's arms, and said, we got you, bro. You're going to make it. We're with you. That's what the church is for. We got to lift each other up, not tear each other down. We spend more time tearing people down than we do building them up. We got more people dividing than unifying. Remember, Satan is not scared of Christians with big Bibles. Satan is scared of unified churches. Your big Bible means nothing to him. Your title Christian means nothing to the devil. A unified church, a together church, man, that makes, that makes the devil tremble. And we have to remind ourselves of that. Look at what 1 Timothy 2.8 says. I desire, I, I, I desire therefore that, that the men pray where? Everywhere. Lifting up what? Holy hands. Without what? Wrath and what? Doubting. How are you supposed to lift your hands? Without what? Wrath. And doubting. Now let me explain this to you and we're done. And we're going to worship a little bit. I'm already ending early. The word wrath means basically don't get mad about the instruction God's given you. You know, some of us, we, we've already had some instruction. But we're mad because we don't like the instruction that was given. And so it's hard for you to lift your holy hands when you got wrath inside. Because you're mad. You're angry. You're bitter. You're resentful, and it's real, and I'm not, I'm not downplaying where you're at. But let me tell you something. How is that working for you? Is it helping you? Are you getting better? 
Are you coming out? Are you seeing healing? The answer is no, you're not. You're not. But he also says, but also without doubting. Now, what does the word doubt mean? Doubt is very simple. When we say doubting, it simply means that you don't question what you're supposed to do. You don't question it. For example, there was a prophet by the name of Elisha. And Elisha was someone who was walking in in miracle signs and wonders. I mean, God was using Elisha in ways that would just blow your mind. And there was this, um, this commander of an army. And he was the commander of the, the Syrian army. And this guy was someone with a lot of power. I mean, this dude was known in this region. And he, he was dealing with a very severe sickness called leprosy. And while he's dealing with leprosy, you know how leprosy is. It's pretty brutal, right? If you guys know anything about leprosy, it literally rips your skin apart. You got sores. It, your skin falls off. You smell. It's, it's bad. It's, you're basically dying while you're alive. And this, this man named Naaman sends his messenger to the prophet Elisha because he's seen the miracles of God. At least this soldier, man, he may have not been close to God, but at least he had enough conscience to know that there was a God that was bigger than his sickness. And he sends the messenger to tell uh, Elisha to come to him and to heal him. And Elisha opens the door of the house and he says, may I help you, sir? He says, yeah, I'm here on behalf of Naaman. And you know Naaman, the commander of Syria, you know, big warlord. This guy, he's a killer, and he wants your help. See, don't let fame move you guys. Don't let titles move you. Don't, don't, let, don't let anybody move you. And, 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 and Elisha said, hey, uh, and he began explaining to him about what was happening to Naaman. Naaman was leprosy sick, dying, and this was the instruction. So Elisha prayed, he said, Hmm. Tell Naaman to go wash himself at the Jordan seven times. And then the messenger's like, okay, yes, sir. And he goes right back. Now, you know that had to be a ride. He gets to Naaman and he says, hey, uh, Naaman, Elijah said to just go wash yourself seven times at the Jordan. Naaman was pissed. He was the wrath of Naaman just, ah. Who the hell does he think he is? Does he know who I am? Like some of us, when God has spoken something, you're mad, you're angry. You don't like the instruction, but it's the instruction, like it or not. And so Naaman is like, you go tell him. Look, look, Naaman was so, like so many of us, we can be so spooky spiritual. Like when we need to be spooky spiritual, we'll do it, but to live it is a whole other level. He knew about the laying on of hands, the waving of the hands, the, the, the parting. Like this guy knew all that stuff. He told, he told Elisha or his messenger to go to Elisha, tell Elisha to just wave his hand over me and I'll be made whole. Like so many of us. God, just do it this way and then I'll believe you. God's like, okay, you stay angry. I love you. Stay angry. Be doubting me. That's fine. I'm still going to love you. God's not going to change for anybody. Amen? And so now uh, the messenger comes back to Naaman and says, hey, uh," he said, ain't going to happen like that. He said, you got to go. And so the reason that that this guy, Naaman, did not want to go to the Jordan and to wash seven times, number one, is he felt he was too good for God's instruction. Number two, the Jordan was dirty. He then even sent his messenger back and said, can't you at least pick the best waters of Israel? My God, do the miracle. I'll I'll wash myself, but my gosh, you know, can we go to Hawaii? You know, can we go to, you know, pick the most beautiful spot on planet Earth? can, Can I just wash there? And Elijah said, enough, I'm done. And then, of course, Naaman got so angry, so mad, and, ah, and he marched his little butt to the Jordan. But guess what? Eventually, he finally obeyed the instruction, and he had to commit the sacrifice, and he had to posture himself in a place of saying, okay, God, I receive it. What has God told you seven times that you have yet to obey? Because the number seven is a number of what? Completion. Maybe he's asked you to forgive someone. Maybe he's asked you to serve. Maybe he's asked you to give. Maybe he's asked you to to change your attitude. Maybe he's asked you to repent. Maybe he's asked, I don't know. 
But what has he asked you seven times? What has he instructed you to do that you refuse because you're full of wrath and doubt? Intellect. You keep trying to figure it out in your head. It's not going to work. It's not. Stand to your feet. Let's go. Faith. There was four good men. And these good men saw their friend. He was a paralytic. And these four guys, man, were obviously, man, they were full of faith. And they saw their friend down and they said, man, we ain't leaving you like that. They heard that Jesus was in town and they're like, this is it. We're bringing him. We're bringing him to church. Man, this dude's going to get saved. He's going to get healed. Whatever. So they pick up the friend who's on a mat or a stretcher and the four friends carry him over to where the church services is happening. The place was jam-packed. The Bible says that no one got in, no one got out. But listen, but when you posture yourself in faith, faith says, I don't give a rip what's in front of me. We're getting in. Faith sees beyond the circumstance. And they saw that and they're like, man, how do we get in, guys? And they all together together they said you know what let's tear the roof let's tear the roof and so they went they climbed the house that's some dude some man and woman's house they ripped the roof open and the bible says that they 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 lowered the paralytic down and the scripture says this verbatim and jesus saw their faith see many times we think that faith is invisible. Not scripturally, it doesn't say that. See, faith is not what you talk. Let me go share my faith. No, no, no. Let me go demonstrate my faith. Demonstrate. We got too much of this, not enough demonstration. Those four guys demonstrated their faith so much that it attracted Jesus and said, I saw their faith. I saw it. So it's not a matter of invisible it's a matter of demonstration. You being here today, that is a demonstration of faith. Because you're coming to worship and to seek a God you don't see, you can't touch, you can't feel, but you know he's real. Or maybe you're here today and you've never been in a church setting like this. Or maybe you've known religion like, yeah, I believe there's a God out there, but you don't know him personally. Well, let me tell you something. You can know him personally. It takes that little faith to say, you know, Jesus, I, I surrender. I'm, I want to give you my life. I'm done fighting. I'm done arguing. I'm, I'm tired of being an intellect Christian. It's exhausting because you're always in your head. It trains you. It depletes you. You'll never come to the truth and you'll never come to the fullness of God because God didn't say, you know what, and you shall walk by intellect. You shall walk by what? Faith, not intellect sight because how many know that you don't see with your eye you see with your head your eyeballs are just the lens but your brain is what sees right now the way you see could be a little bit distorted because you keep allowing doubt fear and unbelief come in listen I want to say this As the scripture said in Timothy, and in the last days, some will fall away from the faith. This is how you need to think. If my 10 friends were to fall away from the faith, I won't fall away from the faith. If my whole family fell away from the faith, I will not fall away from the faith. See, you have to decide, who do you serve? Do you serve fashion, culture, tradition, or do you serve Almighty God? Do you serve Jesus, or do you serve feelings? Who do you serve? And when you decide that, God sees your face as I saw your faith. That was demonstration. You chose to posture yourself 
in a position that favors and rewards you with a spiritual blessing. Amen.